All right, so I'm finishing up a series that I've been doing every Sunday night for the past couple weeks. We've been, I've been preaching on how to serve God. So we started off with how to serve God. I think the first one I did was for women. For women being wanting to serve God. And, and we went through a lot of scriptures that pertain, pertain specifically unto women in the Bible. And then we went into the men last week. And so tonight what I want to preach is a sermon on how children can serve God and, and look at some of the scriptures that pertain specifically unto children. Now, if you're not a child today, there's a lot in this sermon still for you to learn. There's a lot of basics that we're going to be going into because what I'm going to be preaching on with the children especially is they need to get these basics and these fundamentals down when they're young. And now I'm going to be gearing this also not just for really young children, but for children of all ages. Anybody that's at home in their parents' household, where they belong, by the way. And actually, this isn't even in my notes, but I'm going to cover this right now. In Genesis chapter uh, 2, I believe it is, 2 or 3, when, uh, yeah, chapter 2, when God made Adam and Eve, He, he made, uh, uh, you know, He said it's not good for the man to be alone. God didn't want man just to kind of be solitary, right? And just, and just to kind of go through this world on his own. So he created woman as a, as a partner that was an help meet for him. And, and someone to go through this with him. And, and obviously we know the relationship between a man and a woman is a great relationship that God has blessed us with and, and, and given, us, uh, given us, you know, men and women on this earth. And after he created them in verse 24 of chapter 2 of Genesis, the Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And I believe that wholeheartedly to be true, that that is the reason why children should leave their parents. I do not believe the reason that children should leave their parents would be to go off to college or to go off and get their own apartment or because they turned 18 and that's the magic number that you turn and then you're just sent off to live on your own. I think the scripture teaches here that this is the reason why. The reason why you leave your father and your mother is to cleave unto your wife. And you go off and you start your own family. And there's many reasons for that. I think there's very good reasons for that. You see, God never wants us to be just completely, I think, unaccountable. So, when you, when you just think back to when you were growing up. You grew up in a household, right? Hopefully you had a mother and a father. I mean, that's what God designed. I know these days there's a lot of children growing up with single parents, but that's not God's design. That's not God's plan. God's plan is that there's a mother and there's a father to raise the children up and to be there to, to kind of help keep the child in line. And children need that. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Children need that type of authority in their life to teach them the right from the wrong. Well, even after you become an adult, I still believe it's biblical to stay at home because what happens is with so many times, especially when kids turn 18, that's still, I still think that's young. I mean, you may be a man at that point, but you're still pretty young. A man or a woman, that's, that's still very young. And, and what happens is people, they want to go off and not have that accountability anymore. They, they want to live outside of mom and dad's authority. And what happens is they end up getting into all kinds of sin and trouble and, and do a, make a lot of poor choices. Why? Because they can. Because now they can't just stay out. You know, at home, you can't just stay out all night and not have to answer to a mother and a father. You don't have that authority. You're not accountable, at least to some level, when you have your parents at home. When you just go off on your own, nobody's there to look over you. No one's there to watch over you or to keep you from doing some of the things that maybe normally you wouldn't have done. But now that you're just off on your own, hey, you can do whatever you want. And there's nobody there to see. There's no one there to know what you're doing. And it leads you down. It's very easy to lead you down a wrong path. Now, I'm not saying that every kid will do that. Of course not. But it opens up the door for the opportunity to arise. And it makes it that much easier when you don't have that accountability. The, and, and the reason why then you go from being at home with your parents to a spouse, well now, even as a grown man or a grown woman, as an adult, you still have accountability by the other person there, by, by your spouse. Now it's like, okay, well I'm going to go, you know, when I come home, they're there. 
And it's not like my wife just watches over me. Every, you know, I don't need that. It's not the same thing. However, if for, if for some reason, think about this. If for some reason I, I got, I was in a, in a, I was backsliding and I was real tempted to get into some kind of sin, maybe, maybe, maybe to go, go have a drink. I have a real bad day and, and it's just, it, everything is going wrong and, and I'm just, just been tempted and now I'm going to, you know, slip and, and I'm going to, and I'm just going to do something I shouldn't be doing. It's easier to do that when there's no one else around to come home to. You see, like when I, if I were to go out and I come home, my wife's going to know. And that is a thought that you're going to be thinking like, well, now this is going to cause extra problems here. It's better. I'm better off just not doing it. If you follow me. I mean, that's, that's, it, it's a level of accountability that you have. When you leave your parents and cleave to your spouse, and that's the reason why you, you so you go, even though she's not an authority over me, it's still accountability. It's still someone there that's going to know what's going on, that I can't just get away. And, you know, obviously we can't get away with anything because God sees everything. But it's a lot easier, especially when you're backsliding, to kind of put God out of your mind and you have no one else to be accountable to, to start thinking that you, you get away with all this stuff. And that's what, that's what happens on college campuses. It happens with the kids. They get away from their parents. They have all this freedom. And nobody really knows what they're doing. My parents didn't know what I was doing. I, I did that. I, I, I moved away to college. My parents had no idea what I was doing. And I'm sure they wouldn't want to know what was going on there because it wasn't good. It's a lot of wickedness. And, and, it, and it wasn't right. And there's a lot of things that I did then that I never would have done if I were still living at home with my parents. Never would have done because of the accountability factor. And so just, just to start off, I think that kids ought to remain at home with their family until it's time for them to, to find a spouse. Now, and why would they have to move out? They say, oh, I want to be independent. I understand, especially for men, the desire to be independent. But to do things what I believe is God's way I think it's more important and, and, you know, to, to be able to, to stay accountable and to, to work, to, hey, work your life, work your full-time job, whatever you want to do. Live for God, so, you know, save up money, whatever, and then maybe when you do find a spouse, it'll be that much better off. But um, that's what I believe, for, especially for children, is, is don't plan on just leaving the house as soon as you feel like you're old enough to leave the house. You should try to stay at home and honor your father and mother. Now, the first thing that I want to point out here, that, that really was the first thing, but that wasn't in my notes. The first thing I have in my notes that I wanted to cover today with children and the overwhelming commandments and, and, and instruction for children is to obey your parents. This is found many places in the Bible, going back even to the, uh, the Ten Commandments. Right? The Ten Commandments that God etched in stone. In Exodus chapter 20, the Bible says in verse 12, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Children, you need to be able to listen to your parents and respect them and give them honor. And the Bible says that if you do that, your, God will prolong your days in the land. This is a, this is a commandment with promise. Ephesians 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. If you listen to your mother and your father, if you obey your parents in the Lord, you listen to what they have to say, God will, will bless you and he says, he'll extend your life. You know, there's a lot of people that die young. There's, there's, there's actually kids that die. And it's sad. It's really sad when a child dies. When a child loses their life after not many years on this earth at all. It's, it's an extremely sad thing. It's sad when, a, when someone dies in their 20s. It's sad, when, it's, it's, it's sad when people die. You know, as you get older, you kind of, it, it's more acceptable. You say, yeah, well, we understand that death is a part of life. But when people die younger, it's, it's really sad and it's really a shame and, and you lose out on a lot. But the Bible is saying here that God promises to prolong your days upon the land. 
He says, you know, obey your parents. Listen to what they have to say. And a lot of that is inherent into just listening to your parents. You will, if you decide to listen to your parents and obey them, your parents have a lot of wisdom that you don't have right now. You kids, where you're growing, you don't understand very much. You're, you're, le you're constantly learning. You're understanding more and more things. But everything that you're learning right now, your parents already know. Because they're the ones teaching you. And God wants you more than anything. Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. It makes God happy when you obey your parents. So, for example, when your parents say to be quiet in church, when you don't speak a word, that makes God happy because you're listening to what your parents have to say. But you know what? When your parents tell you to do something and you disobey and you don't listen to what they have to say, God's not happy with that at all. It makes God angry when, when, you, when you just disobey your parents and don't listen to what they say because over and over again, the Bible's telling you to be obedient to them, to listen to your parents and to do what they have, what they have for you to do. We started off here in Proverbs chapter 30. I want you to look at verse 17. And kids, listen up to this verse. This is a Bible verse that you need to hear. Proverbs verse 30, or verse 17 of chapter 30 reads, The eye that mocketh at his father. Now that word mock, that means to, to kind of like maybe make fun of and have no respect for their father. So when you look at your father and you, have, you don't have any respect for him and you mock your father or make a joke out of, out of the things that he says, that would be mocking. It says, The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. So someone who just hates to listen to what mom has to say. You just don't listen to what mom has to say at all. You hate to, to, to listen to anything that they say for you to do. The Bible says, The ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagle shall eat it. It's talking about a bird eating out your eyes because you're not obeying your parents and because you're not treating them with respect. That's what the Bible, this is how God feels about children that aren't obeying their parents. That he'd be willing to send a bird to pick out your eyes. Now does that sound like it's fun or pleasant? Do you want a bird to land on your head and start pecking away at your eyeballs? No, of course not. Nobody would want that. But that's how serious God treats this, you know, children of being obedient to their parents. It pleases God. It makes God really happy when you listen and obey. And now listen to me, kids, because I know that there's times when you think that you know better. There's times when you think that what mom's saying is wrong or what dad's saying is wrong and that you know better. And if we only knew what you knew, then we would understand and you try to justify why you disobey mom and dad and why you don't do the things that they tell you to do. But that does not excuse your disobedience. That does not make it right to disobey mom and dad. You need to be able to watch out for pride. All children need to watch out for pride. As you learn certain things, you are gonna, it's a great feeling to learn new things. It's, it's awesome when you start learning more and more and more. And this can apply to anybody that, especially when you're learning the Bible, you start thinking, man, I know more than all these other people. I know more about God and the Bible than all these other people. They don't know anything. And that starts to make you have a proud heart and a proud attitude. And I know you girls specifically in this church are learning a lot from mom at home. She's teaching you. And it can be really exciting. You learn a lot. And as you get older, you start to think that you know better than your parents. And you start to have a proud attitude. The Bible says that knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. We went over this in 1 Corinthians when we did chapter 8. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. So as much as you girls think that you know, as much as the children think that they know, you don't know anything yet. Now listen up. This is important to understand this. As much as you think you know and as much as you've learned up to this point, you don't know nearly enough. 
And children need to keep this in mind. That how much their parents actually know and what they still need to learn from them. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse number 5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. God hates to see people that are proud. You get lifted up and, and full of yourself and you think that you're so smart and that you know so much and that you know better than your parents' children. God says that's an abomination. You need to be under obedience and to listen to what they have to say. That is, that is the number one. If you don't get anything else out of the sermon tonight, understand that being obedient to their parents is the, is the primary thing, especially for the really young children, to keep in mind because your parents know what's good for you. They have rules. You may not understand why we have certain rules, but you have to obey them anyways. If you think about this, you know, your parents were children once too. There is a time, and I know, you, I know the kids in here like, have asked me many times about my childhood and what I used to do. I was a kid once too, and guess what? I made a lot of dumb mistakes. And I didn't always listen to my parents, but I would have been better off if I did. Because they know things that you don't know as a child. And your parents love you, and they want what's best for you, which is why they make up the rules that they do. And you just need to understand that much. That being obedient is going to be good for you in the long run. Now that being said, with obedience, children, obviously everybody wants ought to get saved. We want, we want everyone to be saved. God wants you to be saved. The Lord's not willing that any should, per get per should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And this is a choice children, that you have to make for yourself. Everybody has to make this for themselves. While you have to be obedient to your parents and everything that they do, you, you know, maybe your parents make you come to church, you have to go to church because you need to be obedient to them. But one thing your parents can't do, they can't make you believe on Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's something you have to do within your own heart. That is something that God has allowed for you to do all on your own. Just because maybe your dad's a preacher, that's not going to get you saved. Your own, you have to have your own faith on Jesus to save you. You have to decide to believe for yourself that he paid for your sins and that you need him to save you. And once you do that, then you can be saved. Now, once you get saved, you ought to get baptized. And this goes for every believer. Everybody that gets saved, the very next thing to do is to get baptized. If you know that you're saved and you believe on Jesus, God wants you and commands you to get baptized. He wants you to show everybody else that you believe on Jesus. See, with children, this can be a difficulty. So listen up, children, because oftentimes children don't have the courage or the strength to do things that adults do. And... You may believe in Jesus, but it's too often that kids might be ashamed or embarrassed. And what happens with baptism is that you're showing everybody that you believe in Jesus. You're making that, that public show that to everybody around that I'm going to get baptized to show everybody that I believe on Jesus and that He paid for my sins. And when you get dunked on the water and, and come up again, you're showing everybody that that's what you believe. So other people can know that too. It's, your way of pro, it's one of the ways you can proclaim Jesus as your Savior is by getting baptized. And kids, you need to keep this with you and, and, and remember this, that not to be ashamed of your religion, not to be ashamed of the Bible, not to be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Throughout your whole life, if you decide to put your faith in Christ as a believer, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to try to tell you why you're wrong, why you shouldn't believe in Jesus, why you should be ashamed and, and, and not want to talk about it. And people might um, not want to be around you. But you need to decide what's more important to you. 
Is it just what other people think or is it what God thinks about you? God's the one that made you. God's the one that gave you the parents that you have. God's the one that gives you the food that you have. God's the one that gives you everything. And God is so good to you. God's the one who's given you a free gift of eternal life. We need to make sure that we remember that we are never ashamed of Christ and Jesus and what He did for us. We should never let that, let that happen. Mark 8.38. Stay if you would in Proverbs. We've got a lot of Proverbs to look at still. Mark 8.38 says, This was Jesus Christ Himself said, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. See what Jesus is saying, this is a wicked world that we live in. If you're ashamed of Jesus because of all the wicked people out here that are going to give you a hard time about that, he says, I'm going to be ashamed of you when I come. And we don't want Jesus ashamed at us. We ought to be able to, to, to stand up and to speak for, for God and to, and to be able to tell other people, yes, I believe the Bible. Yes, I believe what Jesus did for me. Yes, I believe that to be true. And not just to back down and, and to not say anything because you're ashamed about it. Don't get embarrassed, kids, when your parents talk about the Bible with your friends. You know, Maybe you have friends come over. And, and you, you, know, you have your play dates. I know you got a play date planned up here soon. When we talk about Jesus, it's a good thing. That shouldn't get you embarrassed or ashamed. That, that isn't something that you should want to prevent your friends from hearing. Because it's good news. Be, I, I would think that if you have friends, don't you want them to go to heaven when they die? You always have to remember and think about that. You want other people to go to heaven, especially your friends. So don't be embarrassed when mom or dad or your sister or brother or somebody else speaks up and starts giving the gospel of Jesus. Because it's so important that it's the most important thing that maybe your friend could ever hear in their entire life. And then they can go to heaven too. It's a good thing. It's something that we should want to do. It's something that you should want to do with your own friends is tell them about Jesus Christ and how He loves them and how He loves you and how He died and paid for all of your sins. Don't worry about what other kids may think. Maybe some people won't want to be your friend because of that. But it's okay because that's not the type of friend that you're going to want to have anyways. If someone has a problem with Jesus, that's not someone that you should want to be around. You should still tell them about Jesus and love them enough to tell them about Jesus. But that shouldn't be your best friend. The Bible says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Apostle Paul wasn't ashamed of God. I'm not ashamed of God, and you shouldn't be ashamed of God either. Don't be ashamed of His free gift. Don't be ashamed of the love that He has. Don't be ashamed of, of the other things in here that the world doesn't like. Don't be ashamed of the Bible. You should be able to, to talk about the Bible and give the gospel to your friends. Learn how to do that, kids. Because sometimes you will be able to talk to your friends that no one else will be able to. And that might be an opportunity for you that nobody else has. I don't think there is an age that is too young for a person to give the gospel. I think if you're saved, that's all that needs to be there. You know how you got saved. You can explain to other people how to get saved. And God wants you to do your best. Okay? And God can use anybody. If you believe in Jesus, you've got the Holy Spirit of God residing inside of you and He's going to do the work. You just need to be able to be bold enough to be able to bring it up and to not be ashamed about what Jesus did for you. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 24. There's a few pages back. Proverbs 24. Now, one thing that goes along with, with being a child, oftentimes you have a lot of failures. You have a lot of things that happen where you, you don't do everything right. It happens. That's how we learn. That's how you grow. That's how you get better. 
And honestly, again, not just for the children, for anybody. If you're, if you're learning how to give the gospel to someone, and you're, you're new to the Christian life, you're just starting to do anything you're starting to do that's new, you'll probably have a bunch of failures. But it's how do you deal with those failures is going to determine how successful you are in the future. Don't let any of your failures make you just quit. That's the worst thing you can do. That is the ultimate failure. If you just decide to give up and to quit, then you're done. Then, then there's, there's no way for you to succeed. There's no way for you to win. There's no way for you to do what's right when you quit. You've just completely stopped it. Don't quit, even if you're not always doing, you know, if you're not winning at the moment, if you have failures. Maybe you don't talk about Jesus when you should. Maybe sometime you do feel ashamed when the conversation turns to religion or comes up and Jesus comes up and you're ashamed and you know you shouldn't be. Maybe these things happen, but don't let that stop you from doing what's right in the future. Don't just give up. Proverbs 24, verse 16 says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. So the Bible says someone who's good, just, someone who's righteous... They're going to fall down even seven times. That's a lot of falling down. You may get bumps and bruises and scrapes and it might hurt and it doesn't feel good to fail. And you fall seven times, but you know what? He keeps getting back up. And we need to remember, kids, you need to remember, even when you fail, even when you do something wrong, get back up again. Try again. Try harder. Move and go for it again. And don't ever give up. You can always, if you're still here, God has, has stuff for you to do. God has a mission and a job for everybody here to do. And just because you have one big failure or many little failures or many big failures, don't let that stop you. And oftentimes, you know, I'll apply this even to coming to church. People will start coming to church. They'll start, you know, getting things right in their life. They get saved. They get baptized. They start getting rid of sins. And then... Something happens. They backslide. They have some major failure in their life. Something happens and then all of a sudden they get embarrassed. They're ashamed of themselves. They don't want to show their face up anymore. So they make their sin even worse. And then they just stop coming to church altogether. They just give up and quit. That is the wrong. That is guaranteed failure. You're never going to start living for God when you just give up and quit. Yeah, I understand. There's setbacks and, and maybe you fail. And... It's too bad when those things happen, but you need to be able to get back up and keep moving forward. You can't just lay down on the ground and just wallow in your own misery. That's not what God wants you to do. You're just going to make things worse that way and you won't have any joy or happiness either. You get a lot of joy. You get a lot of happiness from success. You get a lot of joy when you go out and you get those people saved and when you get victory over sins in your life and you start moving in the right direction. Hey, that brings happiness and joy and it brings you comfort in your mind. But when you just get off into sin and then you just give up, you're not going to have comfort. You're not going to have peace. You're not going to have joy. You're just going to be living in failure. We need to get up and just keep moving forward a just man falls seven times. He, he keeps getting up. Church attendance. I mentioned this already. You know, some children come to church only because they have to. Now, if you're coming to church and you're being obedient, that's good. You've got the first step down, I, I mentioned, being obedient to your parents. But church is important for you. It's important for everybody. God ordained this church to be here. And for every local church that believes on Christ, that is, a, that is a true church, God has ordained for, for pastors and teachers to be able to help you to understand the Bible and to, to edify you and to build you up and to, to help you through your life. I hope that if you're not like this now, one day you will want to come to church. That it'll be a good thing, that you're going to want to hear more, that, that you're going to want to learn and to grow and to understand more about the Bible and more about the truth, about what's right and what you need to do with your life and to help to give you the direction that you need. Psalm 122 verse 1 reads, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Is going to church a burden for you? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. If it is, then, then your heart's not right with God. 
I'll be honest with you, there's times where, there's, you know, there's been times where I don't really want to go to church. And that's not right. But it happens to us, but we ought to want to. I mean, for the vast majority of times, don't get me wrong, the vast majority of times, I love coming to church. I'm excited to come to church. I love seeing the people in church. I love it when, when I see all the faces that show up, and, I, and I'm sad for the people that aren't here, and I'm always thinking about them, but I love coming here. I love being around the people, and I love going through God's Word and reading God's Word and hearing from God's Word and learning more about what I need to do. But hopefully you're like that too because this is good for you. One day you'll be an adult, children, and you will be able to decide what you're going to do. There's going to be a day where that, you know, right now you have to obey your parents, but one day it's going to be up to you. And you're going to have to make that decision. Use the time you have here now to learn. Get the wisdom and get the knowledge from God's Word. Pay attention to the teaching. Pay attention when I'm up here preaching God's Word. This pastor loves you, and even if you're not my child, this pastor loves you. And I'm going to teach you to the best of my ability because I don't want to see you fail. I want to see you succeed. I want to see you do what's right. I want to see you live a godly life and to do and not to fall into all the traps of the sin that probably every adult here can tell you about from personal experience of what they've done that's wrong. We don't want you to go through those things. So that's why it's one of the reasons why it's so important to listen up and to pay attention and to learn and to hear from someone who's been there and also hear just especially from God's wisdom and His Word. God knows everything. He knows what's best for you and what you need to listen to is when He's giving you warnings, telling you not to do certain things or telling you to do certain things, to listen to what God has to say because He's the one who created you and God loves you and God doesn't want you to have a miserable life. He wants you to have a great life. And so does this pastor and so does this church. This church, the people in this church are another family for you. The people in this church love you and care about you and they want to see you succeed also. All, every ch child that comes here. When you understand the motivation, the, where the motivation means the reason why your parents do the things that you do, then maybe it'll be easier for you to listen to them and to obey them. Even when you're disciplined, even when mom and dad give you spankings, it's for your benefit. It's to help you. And I know that may seem crazy right now to, to think that, how does that help me? That doesn't help me. It hurts me. No, it does help you. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, turn if you would to Proverbs chapter 3. In Hebrews 12, verse number 5, the Bible reads, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. And this is for adults too, by the way, as children of God. And that's what the primary application of this verse is. Is for us as children of God not to despise the chastening or the discipline or the spanking that we get from God. Don't despise that. Don't hate that. He says, Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That word scourgeth means he whips them with a whip. Right? The Bible says God loves you when he chastens you, when he disciplines you, when he whips you in this life. It's because he loves you. And children, it's the same way. Your parents, when you get that spanking, it's because your parents love you. It's because we're trying to teach you and, and get you to understand right from wrong. Verse 7, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You should be glad, children, that have parents that give you spankings because they love you and they're doing it for your benefit. And God, when God disciplines you, you could understand that it's because you're his child and he loves you. There's a reason why he's doing it. And again, 
it's never fun. The Bible says that it's grievous for the moment, right? It's, it, no one likes going through it. But we need to have the wisdom to understand after you go, you know, as you go through it or after you go through it that it's really for your benefit. It's for your own good. It may be painful as you go through it, but ultimately it's for your good. I right, do you turn to, to Proverbs chapter 3. We need to be able to, kids, you need to be able to study the Bible and receive the instruction that God has for you. As you learn to read, if you already learn that know to read or as you learn to read, one of the first things you should be getting into is learning the Bible and, and reading God's Word so you can see what He has for you for yourself. Everything in the Bible is good for you. The people that love you are bringing you to church to learn so that you can have your best life possible. Your entire life is still ahead of you, children. You've got a lot of time and a lot of years and a lot of choices to make. There's a lot of things that are going to come up. And we want you to make the right choices from early on. Learn from God early. Look at verse number 1 of Proverbs 3. Now I'm only picking out a few sections of Proverbs here. We're going to look at Proverbs 3 and Proverbs 5. But all throughout the book, you're going to see it's a book of wisdom that's, that's written to Solomon's son. He says, my son, my son, over and over again. You start reading the Proverbs. My son, my son, listen to these words. Listen to the instruction. Listen to the wisdom. Listen up and get this home. Let me drive this into your heads, kids, because this is important. You need to hear this. You need to understand. Proverbs 3, verse number 1. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Listen up, kids. This is important. The Bible's saying you'll get long, long days. You're going to live a long life. You'll have peace. Having peace in your heart is a very good thing. All from listening to God's law and listening to these commandments, listening to your parents. Verse number three, let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart, so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Kids, lean not unto your own understanding. Don't just trust your own thoughts, but you have to trust God with all of your heart. And understand that if He commanded you to do something, like obey your parents, then you ought to do that, and not to just trust your own thoughts. Verse number 6, In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. God will give you the right direction to go in. It shouldn't be a wonder. You won't have to worry about which way to go. God will tell you what's right and wrong and all the answers are found in the Bible. Verse number 7, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Girls, listen up. And everybody listen up to this. this. Again, this is another promise. You know, I believe in tithing, but even just beyond tithing, this is just saying that, you know, if you honor the Lord, and again, and I didn't even use this when I proved a, a few weeks ago in a sermon about the word honor and how it means more than just respect. It is respect, but there's more than that. Here's another application of it being something like financial. You know, honoring your father and mother is more than just respecting them. It's respecting them and taking care of them when they're in need. Here it says, honor the Lord with thy substance. What's your substance? Your, your money, the things that you possess. Honor God with those things and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So when God blesses you and you increase, you, you go out, you work, and God gives you more money. God gives you that increase. Or you plant things and God, you know, God increases that. He gives you um, uh, more than, than what you had. The first fruits, the first reaping, the first gathering, he says, when you honor God and give that back to God, 
at the very beginning, right from the start, I'm going to honor God with the first fruits of my increase. He says, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. God will bless you for that. By faith, if you just say, you know what, God, I'm thankful for the increase that you've given me. Here you go. You're getting the first of it. You're getting the best of it. I'll get the rest, but God, this is for you. Thank you for being so good to me and providing for me. When God sees that heart, when God sees that attitude, he says, your barns will be filled with plenty. You have nothing to worry about when you put God first. And you say, whether it's the stuff that you own or, you know, seeking God with your heart to, to understand what's right to do. God will take care of you, and that takes faith. We need to understand that. And girls, you need to understand that, especially as you get older and you start to accumulate more things. Hey, recognize God. The Bible says every good gift and every, and every perfect gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights, that He's the one who gives us ultimately what we have. He's the one that has given you the abilities that you have, the talents that you have. He's the one that's given me the mind that I have to be able to do the work that I do to earn money for our family, that's, that comes from God. That's not my own doing. He's given me these, these talents and these abilities to do what I do in order to make the, the income that I do. And I thank God for it. And we all have our own abilities that were given to us by God that have gotten us to the point to where we're at. And he says, if you honor the Lord with thy substance, your barns will be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Moving on here, turn if you would to Proverbs chapter 5. Another, another area in a child's life that's going to come up that will be important to children is dating and finding a potential spouse, someone to marry, finding that husband or finding that wife. This is something that children, as they grow up, will want to do. And it will be, first of all, very important to stay away from fornication. Now, I know the kids that are here are really young, so you're probably not going to understand a lot of this. But it's still extremely important and it's a message that we all need to hear anyways and, and to be reinforced over and over again. Maybe you have kids. You need to be able to be teaching this to your children also. Stay away from the physical contact with another person until after you get married. The Bible says, and we went over this in 1 Corinthians 7 in our Wednesday night Bible study, but the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, Now concerning the things wherever you wrote, Unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. I believe the smartest, safest, best way for, for people to date and to find that spouse is to not, not to touch each other. And I believe that goes as far as to, you know, I don't think you should be kissing and embracing and doing all these things that get you really close to committing the act of fornication. It's good just not just to stay away from each other and to stay in places that are public, not going off into your bedroom to talk privately. That's a bad place to go with a date with someone that you're interested in, uh, no matter what your age is. Not a good idea. Don't be alone in a house or in a room or something with someone of the opposite gender that you're not married to. I think you should be going out in public. You're dating somebody. You're interested in someone. There's plenty of places you could go to in public where you can keep things um, pure and you could keep, keep things holy and, and that you won't have to worry about the temptation of fornication arising. You also ought to find someone else who's a believer, a Christian. Very, very important. The Bible admonishes us not to be um, yoked up together with an unbeliever. Uh, you're in Proverbs 5. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Now this is talking about a woman who's trying to entice a man to commit fornication, to lie with her, the way that married people lie together. And... If you're smart, 
you'll understand that it says here the, the, lip, the lips of a strange woman. That's someone that's not your wife is what that is. A woman that's not your wife is a strange woman to you. They may say a lot of things that sound real nice to you. Sweet, like honey. It's really good, right? And their mouth is real smooth, like oil is real smooth. But her end, when you go in unto a woman like that, is bitter as wormwood. It's like poison. Sharp as a two-edged sword. It says her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Now, this is talking about a woman, but don't be deceived. Girls, men can do this very same thing. And men will try to do that. They'll try to get you to go into their bed with them. And don't be tricked by it. Don't be deceived by the guys that just want to do that with you. They'll say things about how much they love you. They'll say things about, about all these nice things they're going to do for you and everything else to get you into their bedroom, and then they're not going to care about you anymore after that. You need to be able to keep yourself pure until the day that you get married and make, make the man prove that they love you and they care about you and they want to be committed to you before you are going to take the step that married people do. That goes for, for men and for women alike. Watch out for the people that are, that are going to do that. This is a very strong statement. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Verse 7, Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Listen to these words. They're important, children. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. He's saying, don't even go close to people's house like that. When you know someone to be like that, a man or a woman, he's saying, here, don't even go by their house. Don't even come close. Don't even allow yourself to be tempted by that at all. Stay far, far, far away from people like that. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger, and thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed, and say, How have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. Don't be that person that just doesn't want to listen to what's right and the truth. And, and to just not be able to, to hear the instruction in advance. Fornication and adultery will destroy your life. Will destroy your life. That's what it's describing. You're saying, you know, strangers, other people are going to get your money, your wealth. It's going to go to other people. You're going to be destroyed. You're going to be brought to nothing when you allow yourself to commit fornication or adultery. When you go in unto the strange woman or the strange man, someone who's not your spouse, it'll destroy you. It'll ruin your life. Get the instruction now before you make the mistake. Don't make yourself have to go through it in order to learn. Wow, the Bible was right. It really is bad. Believe it now from people that love you, that are trying to teach you so that you don't have to make that mistake. We don't want to see you go down that road. It's another aspect of children's life and, and their service to God is, is having friends, right? Hanging out with friends, deciding who's going to be your friend, trying to make new friends and, 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 and become, get best friends and people that you want to have part of your life. And again, I'm preaching to children, but adults, let's take all this wisdom in. This is the book of Proverbs. This is the Word of God. We can all receive from this wisdom. Proverbs 18, verse 24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Friends are good to have. The Bible encourages you to have friends. Turn, if you would, to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It's just after the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. The Bible says if you have friends, you need to show yourself friendly. Don't be the type of friend that always takes, takes, takes from everybody else. 
and that everyone else has to work around your schedule and that and that you know you're the type of friend that you're only going to you're going to use someone else if you're going to have friends you need to show yourself friendly for the friends that you have you need to be able to go out of your way to help them out don't worry about what's coming back to you. You should worry about how can I help my friends? How can I be a good friend to them? Oh, my friend over here is sad. What can I do to help her feel better? Oh, this, this friend needs something. They need help. They need whatever. I'm going to help them out. You need to show yourself friendly if you have friends. That's what the Bible is saying here. Show yourself friendly. And the Bible says also there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You can have such good friends in your life that will be there for you even closer than your own family maybe could be there for you. You can have such a good friend that they'll stick with you through the hard times and through the bad times. It's good to have good friends, but we need to make sure we have the right friends. The friends that will also be there for you in your, in your times of need and the friends that are going to help build you up as much as you're trying to help build them up and to live for God. Someone who's a believer in Christ and is not going to try to, to tear you down and to get you involved in sin and to, and to get you to go the wrong ways in the ways of the world. You need friends that are going to help you to serve God better. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse number 9. The Bible reads, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. This is just common sense here, right? Hey, two's better than one. If you're out there just working by yourself and you get hurt or you fall down, no one's going to be there to help you up. But if you're out there with a friend and one of you gets hurt, one of you falls down, hey, now your friend's there to help you out. It's good to have friends. It's good to have another person there. Verse 11, again, if two lie together and then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So not just having one friend, have a few friends, have multiple friends, and that will add strength to you. It's a good thing to have friends, and you need to show yourself friendly. But we need to make sure that we have the right friends. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 1. We're going to see an example here of what people can do that don't have the right friends. I'm almost done. This will be my last uh, main topic that we're going to focus on. Because what often happens, there's, there's this thing that's called peer pressure. Peer means your friends. Your friends sometimes can pressure you into doing things that aren't good. Or to pressure you into doing things that you don't want to do. But you feel like you need to do them because your friend is telling you to do them. And this is a problem for every child growing up. And you need to learn how to deal with it and to do what's right when something like this happens. It's one of the reasons why it's important to make sure that you are getting the right friends, first of all, so that you aren't getting friends that are going to try to, to pressure you into doing things you shouldn't do. But the Bible gives us an example here. Proverbs chapter 1, look at verse number 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Again, we're seeing the same words over again. Listen up. Listen to the instruction of thy father. Hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Listen to your mom and dad. They've got good words of wisdom for you. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, Consent thou not. That means if, if sinners, if, if people want to do bad things and they're trying to co convince you to do them and they're trying to get you to do these things, he's saying don't do it. Don't consent. Don't agree to, to go with them to do bad things. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. You may be confronted by people that, that will claim to be your friends. They're going to want to get you to do bad things like steal from people or rob from people. And they'll try to entice you and say, well, look, 
We're going to get all this great stuff. We'll, we'll all share it together. We'll get all this money because there's this person that has a lot of money and we'll just take it from them and then we can go buy whatever we want to buy. And people will come up with these plans. Don't listen to them. Don't do it. You need to be able to recognize when people want to do bad things and you need to get away from those people and have nothing to do with them. Don't think that it's the cool thing to do. That this is what the cool, this person's real cool, so I want to do what they're doing. No. When they start sinning and doing wicked things against God, get away from that person. The Bible says, My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. Don't go with them. Don't do these things. You need to be able to remove yourself from them. And I don't care if they're going to make fun of you or laugh at you. You need to be able to stand strong and be able to get away from them and know that even if they laugh at you and you may feel bad because of that, it's way, way, way worse to, to be friends with them and to go and do these types of bad things against other people. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. And in Proverbs 4, a few pages over, Proverbs 4, verse 14 reads, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away, unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Listen up, kids. When you grow up and you start getting older and you have friends that want to try to convince you to drink some alcohol, drink beer, drink wine, drink those, get away from those friends. Have nothing to do with them. Don't drink the wine of violence. It's only going to lead to bad things. I know a lot of kids get curious about, those, about this stuff. And they want to know what it's like and know what it's all about. Receive the wisdom and instruction from the Bible. It's not good for you. It's poison. It's going to cause you to think bad thoughts and evil thoughts just by drinking something. Drinking alcohol, drinking booze, drinking wine, drinking beer will cause you to think things that you should not think. It's going to cause you to sin. It's going to cause you to look at people the way you shouldn't be looking at them. And if you have friends that want you to do that, they shouldn't be your friends anymore. You need to get away from them. You tell them that's not good. That's not right. That's not what the Bible says. And you need to be able to be strong in that. It'll save you a lot of problems. It'll help you to make when you make a decision like that. You it, it'll it'll prevent a lot of a lot of problems in your life. You have to believe believe your parents on this. It's important. And adults, hey, believe God's word. You 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 feel enticed to get in this, to drink some alcohol. It's not good for you. It's poison. That goes for kids and adults. I don't care who you are. I don't think God wants us drinking alcohol at all. He doesn't even want us looking at it, according to Proverbs 23. Look not thou on the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in its cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. It may look cool at first. You may think you're going to have a lot of fun, but in the end... Boom. It's destruction. It's misery. It's no good. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. It's not, it's not for any Christian to be drinking alcohol. I'll tell you that much. Last point, kids. Be loyal to your family and also your church family. You ought to be able to stand up for them. Your parents, your sisters, your brothers. Don't let other people talk bad about your family. Don't let other people talk bad about your church. Children, if you have a new cool friend that's being mean to your brother, to your sister, saying nasty things, don't go along with what your friends do. That's not a good friend to have. You need someone that's going to be there for you and to support you and to support your family and to, and to be helpful and not to cause you to do things against your own family.
That's a bad friend that tries to do that. Don't forsake your family in order to keep a friend. When your family, well, especially when your family is living for God and for Christ, okay? That's not a friend worth keeping. Proverbs 4, verse 23. We're in Proverbs 4 already. Verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. You need to be able to keep your heart clean and, and not be speaking bad, nasty things or talking bad about other people that friends might cause you to do. And the way that you deal with that, if you have a problem with friends that are, that are trying to, to say nasty things, it's called backbiting. When people start talking about someone else and saying bad things about them, it's called backbiting. And this is the way that you deal with it. I'm going to close with this. The Bible says, The north wind driveth away rain. So doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. When you make a really angry face at someone that's starting to backbite against somebody else, so that's a good way to get them to stop doing that. When you let them know that you're angry about that. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear what you're bringing up about other people and just talking garbage about them and bringing up bad things about other people behind their back to me. You give that person an angry look. You say, I don't want to hear that. When you have friends that are trying to do that against your family or, or, or to get you to, to say, oh yeah, you know, hurt, somehow hurt your brother's or your sister's feelings and to go with them, you give them an angry look and say, I don't do that. I love my family. And I love God and I love the Bible. And I'm going to do what's right. <coughs> Kids, it's important to learn from the Bible. It's going to save you a lot of heartache in the future. It's going to save you a lot of problems if you can just listen to your parents, listen to what's being preached at church, and to learn to read the Bible on your own. It will help your... It'll, may, it'll give you the most joyful, happy, peaceful life that you can possibly have. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that you give us. God, I pray that you would please help me to teach my own children. God, help us all here that are parents or one day will be, dear Lord. Help us all to be able to, to teach and instruct our children to the best of our abilities, dear Lord, that you would guide us and grant us the wisdom and knowledge so that our children don't have to make the same mistakes that we've made. Lord, that they could learn how to grow up and to love you and to cherish your words, dear God, and to take them to heart. We want to see them succeed. God, I want to see every child that comes to this church succeed. I want to see them grow up with a better chance than I ever had, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please help us all to strengthen the children and help them to do that, dear God, and strengthen us. Lord, help us to do what's right. Help us to keep these, uh, to be able to be good examples for everything that we went over tonight on what kids ought to be doing, dear Lord. Help us to be doing those things that we can show them the good and the right way through our own actions, dear Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.